Hi there. So in this video, we're going to be doing the first lecture in unit seven. So this, this whole unit is, is actually about one economic model called aggregate demand and aggregate supply, along with fiscal policy, which is one of the levers of, of kind of, of the tools in the toolbox, right, that we can use to help the economy, right? Remember the first question that I, that I told you about at the beginning of the semester was that we're thinking about um, how's the economy doing, right? And that was whole unit six. How's the economy doing? And then from here on out, it's okay, now what do we do about it? So we got to learn this one additional model called the ADAS model, or aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And then we're going to, lose, we're going to learn how to deal with that, right? So that's our, our kind of three topics, in fact. So the first topic is lecture 7.1, aggregate demand. And in fact, I, I had some differences in numbering later on, um, but generally speaking, AD and AS are going to be 7.1. So let's get started. Aggregate demand. Aggregate's a big, scary word. It just means added all together. That's all it means. When you've added everything together into one spot, it's aggregate. So this is the demand for all the goods and services that buyers are willing to purchase at all of the different price levels um, in, in a country. So another kind of shorthand way to think about it would be it's the demand for everything by everyone in the United States. Um, that's not a perfect definition. It's not really the summation of demand curves, but it's something like that, right? Now, this aggregate demand curve, just like the regular old demand curve we learned, has a downward slope, right? It's a downward sloping line, which means there's an inverse relationship because it's downward sloping. And it's between the quantity of aggregate demand and the price levels in the whole economy. So it's very similar when we said demand is the relationship between price and quantity demanded. This is the relationship between quantity of aggregate demand and price levels in the whole economy. And, and one of the assumptions that, that I have to mention here is we have to hold everything else constant. That's true of every model we learn about. And this one, it's particularly true. We have to hold everything constant. And what we observe is that if price levels change, that that will change the quantity of aggregate demand, but it doesn't move the aggregate demand curve around. Just like price doesn't shift the curve, we would say that price levels don't shift the curve. And that's a little less exciting. But, but the idea is that if the price level changes, if inflation changes, right? That's another way to say this, inflation, um, we would say that that's not going to change aggregate demand in, in a direct sense. We'll, we'll learn a little bit more about it later. There's three reasons for why this curve has a downward slope. Just like there were reasons for why there's a downward sloping demand curve, there's three reasons for why there's an aggregate slope, an, a, a negative slope for an aggregate demand curve. First is that when we observe that price levels go up, we'll kind of notice that the purchasing power of money goes down. And so every single household um, decreases the quantity of consumption spending that they make. And that's that's the idea that like, you know, within aggregate demand, like they're not as able to buy quantity as much stuff when price levels are higher. Um, and so that that's what we call the wealth or real balances effect, because it literally means the real balance, like the real balance, not the nominal, but the real balance of your checking account gets smaller when there's higher inflation. A second reason for why aggregate demand is inversely related, or the quantity of aggregate demand is in really inversely related to inflation or price levels, is something called the interest rate effect. And this one, if the price levels go higher, if inflation goes up, right? So whenever we talk about price levels, you just got to think that's what inflation is. Inflation goes up lenders are going to raise the nominal interest rate. We learned about that in the last unit with the relationship of interest rates and inflation. They're going to raise that nominal interest rate. And in response, firms and households are going to cut back on their borrowing. And that's going to decrease the quantity of consumption spending and the quantity of investment spending that goes on. Because a lot of times people finance their, their consumption and their investment spending through borrowing. So if the interest rates are higher as a nominal rate, we'd expect there to be less borrowing and therefore less quantity of consumption and investment. Again, it's not going to move the curve around. It's just moving us to a different point along the curve. Third reason, and this one's a little hard to understand. Maybe we'll get to it in unit 10 when we talk about world kind of economy, the global economy. This is the idea that if the price levels go up in your country and the inflation is higher in your country, then foreigners are not going to buy as much of your stuff. They're going to look at your stuff and say, gee, I, I don't want to buy your stuff. It's, it's way more expensive. And likewise, domestic people or right, people within your country will say, gee, domestically produced stuff is a lot more expensive. So I'm going to buy more foreign made stuff, quantity right? So that's going to change the net exports in terms of the amount of, of exports are going to go down because foreigners aren't buying as much. And at the same time, imports are going to go up because people are going to say it's cheaper to buy that Brazilian toothpaste instead of the American-made toothpaste because 
price levels are higher in America, the inflation's higher in America, so I'll buy the foreign toothpaste, right? Um, now, graph of aggregate demand, it's pretty straightforward to kind of look at. You just do one of these, right? Down here, we're gonna actually, um, so I'll kind of advance our slides here a little bit. We're gonna put GDP R for real GDP. Another thing you can put down here, which is equal to it, is Y. Y is just our kind of word or our letter we're going to use for output. So if you like the letter Y, you can put Y, that's perfectly fine. If you want GDP R, that's fine as well. This is the amount of output of goods and services, the value of them. So it's kind of a dollar denominated amount here. And it's the dollar value of all those goods and services. Up here, we're going to put PL. What's that stand for? It stands for price levels, right? And, and what we're going to find is demand to the dirt, right? And so we're going to just label it aggregate demand. So bada bing, bada boom, right? And if we have a change in price levels, right? If we have price levels go up, then we just move up along this aggregate demand curve. So again, all these three things here are just telling us why. If price levels go up, then we're actually going to see a reduction in the quantity demanded, right? In terms of quantity of aggregate demand, it'll go down. And again, I just explained why that is up here. Now, just like with demand, we can shift it, right? Aggregate demand can shift. And we'd say that if we shift it to the right, right, aggregate demand shifts to the right, that is what we call an increase. So a right is an increase. And lucky for you, we're keeping the same rules as last semester. If we had aggregate demand two over here and we shift to the left, that's a decrease. So always going to be to the left is a decrease, to the right is an increase. That's an increase in the overall amount here. So it changes the relationship between output and price levels. And that's not going to be because of these three things up here. That's going to be the shifters that are listed down here. Now, remember last unit, I told you CIGXN is really important, right? Consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Sometimes students say to me, Glossinger, I'm really looking forward to getting a, uh, sorry, I should probably just show you. I'm looking forward to getting this econ tattoo, right? Now, you know, this is like, oh, I'm getting all these tattoos. I want to get some econ ones. That never actually happens. But right, on the odd chance that it might, I would say macroeconomics, one of the things you probably want, you know, if you want that cheat sheet down your arm, is CIGXN. It's that important. It's the three, the four things, can't count, that underlie aggregate demand, right? So if, if consumption changes, if investment changes, if government spending changes, or net exports change, change in a, in a sense, like an actual change in them, not just quantity, then it will change CIG extent, it'll change aggregate demand. So if any of them go up, aggregate demand goes up. If any of them go down, aggregate demand goes down. So let's talk through some examples. And I put a bunch on this slide right below me, um, but I'll talk you through some things that would affect consumption, like a real change in consumption. If there's something that changes the wealth of consumers, right? Even the perceived wealth of those consumers, like if there's a stock market crash, then people will pull back on their consumption spending. Um, so you could say, you know, stock values will sometimes do that. If there's a real estate market crash or a real estate market boom, then people will perceive themselves to be wealthier and they'll go out and they'll buy more fancy stuff. They'll go out and buy more restaurant meals and more cars and all kinds of stuff. And that's consumption spending, right? Another one is consumer expectations. Consumer expectations. And this is one where if your consumers kind of fear the future, if they're like, oh, there's going to be a recession next month, that's what all the news keeps talking about, then people will pull back on their consumption. If you fear a recession now, rationally, you should start saving, right? You squirrel away some of the acorns for the bad times. And so if you expect, though, that the economy is going to be great in 2021, then you might start spending more. So think about the pandemic, right? If people expect that the pandemic is going to come to an end soon, they're going to feel a little more comfortable about spending money and things like that. But if they're like, nah, we're in for the long haul, they're going to save a lot more of their money. And that's going to change consumption, right? If they save more, then they're not consuming as much. Another one is interest rates. And that's a lowercase i, interest rates. And this is the idea that if the interest rates change and it doesn't have to do with, with price levels, right? So this is where things can be a little confusing. If basically the lenders just start charging higher interest rates, or if the lenders start charging um, lower interest rates, and it's not related to price levels, then it, it can change people's consumption patterns, right? So, so what we're going to have to do on a test is look at it and say, okay, is this interest rate, is it changing because the inflation changed? Or are lenders just like, ah, let's charge higher rates? And, and there's a whole host of reasons we'll look at later in the semester why they might do that. But if the interest rate changes and it's not related to price levels, it can affect consumption spending. 
Another one is tax rates and transfers, um, taxes and transfers on consumers and, and private households. And this is one where if, you know, if the government says we're going to increase tax rates, you might think to yourself, oh, that's going to affect government spending. Wrong. No. Just because the government collects more in taxes doesn't mean it's going to spend it. And likewise, just because they collect less in taxes doesn't mean they're going to spend less. Just connect those two ideas in your head. Uh, take a government class you know, and, and kind of remember that government will spend money even if they haven't collected taxes. They'll borrow it sometimes, right? And we'll talk more about that later in this class too. But, but if they change the tax rates, it can ch change your consumption, right? And transfers are the reverse of a tax. If they increase their transfer payments to people, it will affect consumption. Going back to the pandemic, those, those big checks that the government has been writing to individuals, right? Those are designed to stimulate consumption spending. Those are transfers. Um, it's a perfect example of it. When the government just cuts you a check and says, here, have some money, the goal is to stimulate consumption spending and push aggregate demand up, right? So start thinking about why did they do that? Next one is investment spending. And remember, you know, you've got a whole bunch of things in here that, that could affect it. Um, interest rates is the same idea as consumption spending, interest rates would affect investment spending because if, if the lenders say to themselves, we're going to charge a higher interest rate, it's going to affect the businesses that are borrowing to expand their businesses, right? You're not going to build a whole new factory if it's too expensive to borrow to do it. Another one is business expectations about the future. If the businesses expect that you know this year is going to be rocking and rolling, then they're going to expand their businesses. They're going to build a new retail shop, um, they're going to buy new machines and all that stuff. So if the businesses expect that it's going to be great times, then they're going to spend more on investment spending. They're going to beef up, right? But if they're like, oh, recession's coming, bad news, we're not going to do that, then they're going to cancel their orders. Um, they're going to say, no, we're not going to buy that new. If you're, if, you're a, um, if you're an airline, you're going to say, you know what, Boeing, we don't want those new airplanes because we don't, we don't think it's going to be very good. So we're going to cancel the order for the new airplanes. That's investment spending, right? They're buying machines that are being used for other stuff, and that would affect aggregate demand. Another one is taxes, right? Just like before, but in this one, it's corporate taxes, right? So I'm going to include here corporate, corporate taxes, corporate taxes. Um, that's another one. Another one that sometimes throws students off is if there's like new tech or machinery that gets invented um, that makes workers a lot more productive. Well, businesses will often go out and buy those things, right? If there's some kind of breakthrough in technology and machinery and businesses are buying them, then that's aggregate demand. That's investment spending. So they're going to increase aggregate demand. Government spending is relatively straightforward. This would be spending on, uh, you know, airplanes, like, you know, fighter jets and stuff and boats and bullets and I don't know what else the government buys. They buy roads. They build those, right? Um, they build. Um, they they build all kinds of cool stuff. I don't know. They you know if if they um, increase pay to their workers, right? That's government spending because they're spending it on on hiring workers and things like that. It is not taxes or transfers stuff like that, right? So an important observation here is that, remember, social security checks do not get counted in government spending because they're not spending them on goods and services. So any transfers like social security payments or you know all of that, that could affect consumption spending because if you said, let's ramp up how much we're giving to grandma every month for her retirement check, grandma is going to go buy more cat food, right? And that's consumption spending. But it's not government spending because the government's not the one buying the cat food. It's the final good or service. So if the government's the buying more aircraft carriers, that affects government spending, but not if they're handing out more cash to grandma. That's consumption spending when grandma spends it, right? It's not the actual amount of her check. I know that's technical, but I'm trying to give you the right answers here. The last thing are net exports. And there's a, there's a few things that could affect that. The first and easiest is trade partner economic conditions. And that's a fancy way of saying something. Um, that, that I'll kind of explain in a second. Give you a second to write that down. Economic expectations. Um, or no, I, I meant to say economic conditions. Derp. Economic conditions. And this would be like if, you know, you have the United States and the European Union. And the European Union is buying lots and lots of stuff from the United States. And then all of a sudden, the European Union goes into a recession. Oh, those Europeans, they're not buying as much American stuff. So U.S. net exports would go down. So that requires some little mental gymnastics. Repeat that after me, right? If the EU goes into a recession, then they're not going to buy as much American stuff. And so American aggregate demand will go down because American net exports go down. 
right? So think about that one for a second. That one requires a little mental math, right? right? And likewise, the other reverse is true, right? Like if the EU goes into a boom, they're going to buy more of everything. And some of that's going to be American made stuff. And so when they do, the U.S. net exports will go up. So U.S. aggregate demand would go up. Now, the second thing that's going to affect it are exchange rates. And this is really, this is some technical stuff. This is some really tough stuff, but I believe in you. I believe in you. You could do this. Exchange rates. Now, I'm going to explain exchange rates this time, right? But we're going to come back to them. There's going to be a whole unit where we talk about international trade. And this one is the idea that if, right, I'm going to give you an example here. If the U.S. dollar depreciates, which means, it just means that it becomes less valuable relative to the euro, relative to the euro, to the European currency, then we'd say, therefore, U.S. goods, right, goods become cheaper for Europeans. Okay, so that's the, that's the link that's really tough is if the dollar goes down in value to the euro, the goods in America are now cheaper to Europeans. So I'll give you an example of this, right? Imagine that we started with one to one, that one euro bought one dollar. And if you're a European and you're thinking about, I want to buy something from America, well, it costs you basically a euro, you turn it into a dollar and then you buy it. But now imagine that the dollar depreciates, it becomes less valuable. And now the euro buys two US dollars. Right? So that's what it means. When we say something depreciates, it means it's less valuable. And, and now in order to do that exchange, if you wanted a euro and you had dollars, you'd have to give up $2 to buy one euro. So we say the US dollar depreciates. That means if you're a European and you still have that one euro, now you can buy two US dollars with it and you can still buy two US goods, right? If the, if the good that you were going to buy cost a dollar before, well, you used to be able only to buy one. Now you can buy two. So U.S. net exports would go up. If the dollar depreciates, right, then your exports will go up. If your currency depreciates, your exports will go up. Right? If your currency depreciates, your exports will go up. And that's really the thing that you got to remember with that. The reverse is true as well. If the dollar appreciates, it goes up in value, and the dollar appreciates, then the goods in the United States are more expensive for foreigners. And so foreigners would say, ah, I'm not going to buy as much. I can't buy as much American-made goods. And so U.S. exports would go down. That one's really technical. We're going to spend a whole unit on it. So don't worry if you're not 100% on exchange rates. The other stuff, though, you got to know. You got to know it. This is really, really important stuff. So I'm so glad you watched this video. All right. Hope this helped you. See you next time.